Corporal James Barton Dunn, United States Marine Corps, World War II. Jim Dunn was the first veteran that I interviewed almost 20 years ago, February 9, 2003. Here where I live in Grand Junction, Colorado. I met Jim Dunn, 78 years old, almost 79 at the time. And this was the first interview, folks, as raw as it is, very first interview. And I want to just take a little bit of time here and talk about my work. Um, like I said, Jim served in the Marine Corps. He was over in the South Pacific. He fought at Saipan, Tinian. He was wounded on Tinian, received a Purple Heart. And it was just a Marine's Marine, folks. He's just a wonderful man. I got to know Jim after our interview. We did some events together, and he passed away in 2011 at the age of 86. So I was from Ohio. But Jim and I, I just can't say enough about this guy. And um, I know a lot of you like the salutes. When Jim salutes on this video, it's, it makes me cry. So, But I, I'm just so happy to bring his story to today. But you know, the way I started my work 20 years ago, I, I remember I was putting my flag out here at my home in Colorado, and I was thinking, you know, the world doesn't just need another documentary. What's going to be different about mine? Two things came to mind. Number one, the stories come from the source. And number two, the day is going to come when I share these stories with our younger generation. Well, I've been true to both folks. The story has come from the source, no narration. I went right to the source. You know, Saving Private Ryan, Steven Spielberg had the actors. I wanted the real thing, so I went to the veterans. So I started my work and I found World War II veterans in Arizona. I did a few interviews here where I live. Um, they were in their late 70s, early 80s at the time. At the time, 1,500 World War II veterans were dying every day in our country when I started my work. There were about four and a half million of them. Today, there's probably less than 100,000 maybe. I've lost most of my World War II veterans. The ranks have grown thin. But Jim Den's the very first Marine I interviewed, very first veteran, and I just want to stop here and just reflect on that and the work that I've done, um, documenting and recording stories, capturing courage on camera. And uh, I want to thank, a special thank you here, folks, to Billy Grimes. He's United States Marine Corps, United States Navy retired, and his grandson, Jax Grimes, who saved up his money so he could help his grandpa sponsor this story. And it, that really touched my heart. Billy, Jax, I salute you guys. And Billy, I salute your father, who was a B-29 pilot in World War II, and, and you, sir, served with an F-18 squadron and were deployed on the USS Ranger. So a lot of military history in your family. So Jax, thank you for saving your money. And Billy, thank you. God bless you. I know you want to sponsor some more stories. But I'll, just a great big thank you to you and a hug. Um, from me to you. So I know Jim Dunn would be proud, his family would be proud, and I'm just excited to share his story with you today, folks, and uh, reflecting on 20 years of work that I've done across North America, over a thousand interviews, probably almost three quarters or a million miles traveled by air, and just so many stories, so many stories, and I'm so thankful for all of you who have helped sponsor some of these stories, and it takes a lot of resources. You know, the interviews are done, but the, the stories need to be brought forth, and it takes a lot of time, blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of effort. So God bless you. Thank you for those of you who helped sponsor these stories. And um, just very reflective today, January 10th, 2023, as I record this introduction for Jim Dunn. So, But I'm proud of my work. I feel I've been serving my God and my country through the lens of my camera the last 20 years. I came close to serving in the military during the Gulf War. And uh, my father served during the Korean War. My uncle was in World War II with General Patton's Third Army. And my brother-in-law, Dean Daly, served in the United States uh, Navy in Vietnam. So I have military history in my family. But I've always felt guilty for not serving in the actual military. But I tell you, through the eyes and ears of my veterans, I've been there. I've been there. I can tell you what combat looks like, smells like, tastes like, feels like, and, and just is like because of the stories that I've heard. And it just really really been an educational journey for me and I call it an incredible journey and my hope is to interview some more veterans this year. I have been kind of in retirement from interviewing but I want to interview some more Vietnam veterans this year so if you're interested in that and you're out there get a hold of me. So, Okay folks if you'd like to sponsor one of these stories like Billy and Jax have done today please contact me on my website LarryCapetto.com click on the link sponsor a vet or in the video description, which is below this video, that information that a lot of people never read, there's information on how you can become a sponsor and take ownership in one of these stories yourself. It's exciting. There's a connection as you do this, and there's an excitement with it, folks. Or if you'd just like to donate to my work, in the comment section of this video, you can do that. So, my heart's full today. Jim Dunn, I miss you. I know you're in heaven. I salute you. Semper Fi, Semper Fidelis, Ura. 
And all you Marines out there, I think you're going to enjoy this one. Again, this is my very first raw, unedited interview that I did almost 20 years ago. And I'm just really, I got butterflies in my stomach to share this with you today. So thank you for subscribing to my channel and sharing these videos. And I'll talk to you next time. God bless you. James Dunn or Jim Dunn? Oh, Jim Dunn. Okay, D-U-N. Yeah, but I always sign my name James B. Okay. So I don't get mixed up with some other Dunn. Okay. There's a Dr. Dunn, James Dunn, and half the time they'd call me, went to get a hold of him, and I'd say, well, what's your problem? Maybe I can solve it over the phone. And then I'd tell him to call the regular James Dunn. Okay, Jim, what's your birthday? May 3rd, 1924. So how old are you today? Right now, I'm uh, 78, but in a couple of months I'll be 79. Okay, okay. And Margaret, M-A-R? G-A-R-E-T. Okay, all right. Okay, Jim, tell me, um, did you, okay, we're going to talk a little bit about the war now. Did you enlist or were you drafted? Oh, no, I enlisted. Okay, what year? Uh, 1942. And what branch of this military? Well, first I attempted to enlist in the Navy. My dad wouldn't sign the papers. So, after he wouldn't sign the papers and I came back, see, before the war started, before we got involved, before Pearl Harbor, you always heard about the British Navy doing this and that, and I thought, boy, that's a great outfit to be in, the Navy. You know, you heard about the Grass Spay, it was down off of the coast of, uh, I think, Brazil, and uh, it was a German uh, uh, heavy cruiser, and the British, uh, 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 two, I think, two of their uh, cruisers uh, uh, kept it from escaping, and finally they sunk it. And I thought, oh, what a great outfit to be in. And uh, so, uh, and then when Dad wouldn't sign uh, the papers, I told Mom, I said, I'm going to go to Canada and join the uh, Canadian Air Force. And she said, no, if, if you're going to serve, I want you to serve in the United States uh, service, you know. So, okay. So then I thought, well, how am I going to do this? I practiced my dad's handwriting for about a month. And I thought, well, I'll go down. And, oh, Wake Island. I think it was Wake Island, another where the Marines put up a tremendous battle uh, to defend the island against the Japs when they invaded. I thought, boy, that's the outfit for me. You know, it was all in the paper about that. So I went down to join the Marine Corps then after my mother told me she didn't want me to go to Canada. At that time, they were looking for volunteers. I mean, a lot of young men, older than I was, of course, they were going to Canada to get in the Canadian Air Force. See? So that's what I was wanting to do. But then when, uh, uh, I think, Wake Island and uh, another island, I can't think of it, uh, was in the papers how they were, uh, you know, the Marines courageously defended the island. I thought that's what I'm going to do. So I went down and passed the, no trouble passing the physical or the mental or the writing. I went down to the Custom House again, that's in Philadelphia, and uh, signed up for the Marine Corps. Well, you had to bring back your papers, only 17, and you have to have your parents' signature. See, you're supposed to have two parents' signature. So, when I, 
when I came back with the enlistment papers, I told mom, I've already uh, surveyed uh, a town called Ar as though she would be uh, an authority on it. And she said, is that right, ma'am? He said, and she said, yes, sir. So he, he stamped the thing and I signed the name and I went in, into the Marine Corps and uh, went down to uh, Paris Island and into boot camp. Okay, uh, what was your MOS in the, in, the, in the Marines, right? Yeah, I was in the Marine Corps. Okay, what was your MOS? What was your job? My job? Oh, I had different jobs. When I first, first went in, to, to make a long story short, my dad thought I was over at his cousin whitewashing the basement walls. Uh, some of the old houses in Pennsylvania have dirt walls, mm -hmm. you know, in the basement, and you whitewash it. I don't know whether you're acquainted with that. It's just a, 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 a whitewash you put on there. And I told him I'd be over there for uh, three days doing it, because he, he's going to wonder why I'm not at home, see? So <laughs> he finally called over, went over there after I was gone a couple of weeks and wonder how long is this job going to take, you know? We went over there and he finally said, anyway, he wrote me a letter and he said, good luck. He said, if that's what you want in the Marine Corps. So, and then I went, first thing I went uh, after, uh, I was interested in uh, being a radio man, didn't know much about it, but I thought that'd be good. And I passed the uh, uh, qualifying test to go to radio school, only it was filled up. So then they said, well, how about demolition school? I said, yeah, that's fine. So I went to demolition school in Quantico, Virginia. And, uh, and then I went overseas with an with a, uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, company. And when I got to Samoa, uh, they were uh, asking for volunteers. Uh, they were forming the 3rd Raider Battalion. So I said, that's for me. And the first sergeant said, gee, you're crazy. That's a suicide outfit, <laughs> see? So it was good training. I went in there. Everything you'd done in there was on the double. You had to run to chow. You got up. They'd wake you up at sometimes at 2 o'clock in the morning and let on there was an invasion of the island, and we'd have to go all night long no matter how wet or cold it would be. It wasn't very cold, but wet. It gets pretty chilly at night. And uh, we had excellent training. At that time, we didn't use Higgins boats or anything. We used what the uh, rubber rafts to come in. We were supposed to make landings off of submarines. Submarines we were going to be like a hit and run outfit. See, not something that you could sustain a battle. We didn't have any uh, mortars or anything like that. It was just uh, mostly riflemen. See, we were supposed to go in like blow up like a uh, radar uh, station or something like that. See. What, what rank were you, Jim? What rank? At that time? Oh, as a private. Oh. At that time, I tell you what, people shipped over in the Marine Corps to just make PFC. <laughs> See? Okay. But I'm going to go into talking a little bit about the Higgins boats now. Okay. Um, what, what, okay. What major campaigns were you in, and what do you remember about the old Higgins boats? Tell me about some experiences with the Okay. Boats. When we went to Guadalcanal uh, on the, the third raid of time, of course, it was already pretty well secured. So we consolidated, there's a, a, a Russell Island, which would be northwest of Guadalcanal towards Japan. We went in there and the Japs left 10 days ahead. It's a good thing because I don't think we were that organized. Uh, we might have uh, been in a rough battle if they had been Japs there because we went up there on a, on a light cr uh, cruiser and, uh, it, and it pulled right into a, a uh, you'd say like kind of like a little harbor, but uh, I thought to myself, and I was only 18, I thought, geez, you know, the skipper of this ship, he's, you know, he can't maneuver if the Japs did come over. I mean, he's in a, he's in a waterway like a channel, see? But anyway, there was nothing there. So when we came back, uh, our headquarters, uh, our camp was in, uh, 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 oh, what the heck's the name? Uh, Big Islands right south of Guadalcanal. Uh, mm. Jeez, can't bring it to my mind now. It's okay. New Hebrides. Okay. We're in New Hebrides, and the uh, weather there or the climate there is similar to Guadalcanal. There's an awful lot of malaria. It's all jungle. And uh, the natives there, uh, they're spooky as can be to us. They were real skinny and real uh, uh, dark black people and they had red hair, and they chewed betel nut, uh, betel nut, whatever that is. I never chewed any, but it made their teeth black. And when they would smile at you, <laughs> oh, it was kind of leery, you know. So anyway, uh, 
they even had a, a, a headhunters war. Uh, there was they were fierce, and they had. Uh, that's the first time I run across uh, papaya plantations. They had these papaya trees, you know, planted the French. That was a French island, and, and so I think uh, I think maybe even Guadalcanal was in uh, uh, the uh, Russell Island. I think belonged to the British and the coconut grows and all there, they claim that we had to replace every one of those trees we destroyed and paid them $100 a tree. And I thought, boy, that's awful. I mean, we're taking the island back for them and have to pay for the damage. Yeah. See? So that's the, way, that's the way things happen. Tell, tell me, okay, now you want to know about the Higgins yeah, boat. Tell me, in, in your mind, in your memory, go back to when you first rode on a Higgins boat. Tell me about the boat and tell me where you were going. Okay. Told you about malaria is the reason why uh, they uh, they sent us to New Mia, New Caledonia. It's a more temperate climate. To get rid of malaria, you have to come to uh, uh, a cooler climate. And they had a hospital there in New Mia. When I got out of the hospital, I had black water fever and, and uh, just skin and bones, I guess, from malaria. And uh, when I got out of that, went back to the uh, 3rd Marine Raider Battalion. They sent the whole outfit down there. Well, they disbanded all the Marine Raiders after that. They didn't have any use for them because of, uh, it's uh, something at the small islands. It just wasn't practical, I suppose. So they shipped me down to uh, New Zealand, and I went into the 2nd Marine Division, the K Company, 3rd Marines, 8th Marines, 2nd Marine Division. They were in Wellington. We came into New Zealand and Auckland. See? And I went down there, and when I got in this outfit, I thought, boy, these are the least trained troops I've ever seen, you know, because we were used to, we were in good shape as far as physical and uh, being able to run and maneuver and shoot. Uh, I could handle a rifle, and I was an expert marksman. And uh, so anyway, that's when I first got acquainted with Higgins boats. See, we're going to go train there for a while. Uh, it was in uh, it was in their uh, uh, winter months, which would be our summer, and uh, it was rain, and it was damp, and stuff like that. So, make a long story short, I didn't know much about Higgins boats. We ne never went out on any maneuvers on them. See, so when we get on the troop ship in Wellington uh, Harbor. That, by the way, my dad reminded me when I told him, I said, well, he knew geography the world over. He said, that's, that's the deepest harbor in the world, you know, real nice harbor. We're on the boat out there along the dock, and it's, it's now turning towards uh, November. You know, it's getting warm. It's hot aboard that ship. And I don't like being cramped up. I never did like taking orders if I thought they were screwy, you know. So <laughs> I said to Jim Mansfield, a buddy of mine I met, in this outfit. I says, hey, I said, you notice those fellows taking garbage cans over uh, down the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, at the head of the, of the ramp, you know, there would be a guard mm -hmm. to, to keep us fellows, to keep us fellows on board ship. Right. And they had the whole area like a chain link fence, high chain link fence, about 10 feet high, something like that, that kind of type of a fence mm -hmm. surrounding the whole area. And uh, so I'm watching uh, these fellows taking, uh, going down, and when they get down to the dock, they went, oh, maybe about mm, 20 yards, and there's a big dumpster there, and they're putting the garbage in there, and then they come back up, you know, uh, the, the guard down at the bottom of the gangplank, he, you know, he's watching everything. So I notice at a work detail from way over to the east, is coming with these trucks every so often. Mm -hmm. So I timed the trucks. Okay. And I said, what we're going to do, Jim, I said, we're going to take empty garbage cans down. We'll put some boxes on there. And we'll have our, we call them piss cutters. That's the hat you wear, you know, uh, kind of like you'll see them in some of the pictures I got. I said, we'll put them up there. And I said, our, our dress shoes, you know, so we can't wear these field shoes. And I took my oldest ones. And I had my dress ones up on top when we were carrying out these garbage cans. So we had the time just right. When we got down to the end, we got the, here comes this uh, truck, you know, with the work detail. We took our shoes and hat out of the top and got in the truck, and them guys knew what we were doing. They dragged us and put us underneath their feet because when they go out, when they go out of the gate, they have to have a manifest telling how many is on this work crew. 
So the guard would open the flap. These are covered, you know, with canvas trucks. Uh, I guess 16 wheelers or 18 wheelers. And uh, so we were under their feet. And the guy looked in, he counting them on. Yeah, off we went. And we so we spent we spent I don't know at least 10 days, maybe two weeks. And our uniforms are getting pretty scruddy looking. And the shore patrol chased us one time. And we ran up and we, we outran, went around a corner, went into this, uh, just row houses, and went in there and shut the door. And I saw they weren't around the corner yet, and they didn't know which, which they knew we disappeared somewhere. So we went upstairs, and this lady was real nice. She let us in. We told them that the, uh, the shore patrol was looking for us down below. So she was real nice. She said, well, she said, if you don't mind, she said, I'll, I'll, I'll press your uniforms. I'll sort of damp them. All they were were khakis. Part of this documentary is going to be on Andrew Higgins and the guy who built the boats. Right. I, I'm going to get to you in about yeah, two minutes. Yeah, tell me about getting on the boats and what it was like riding on the boats. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Keep going. Let me uh, finish this story sure, for you right on. quick. Okay. So, one day, oh, the St. George Hotel. We check in down there and they said on our boat, I forget the name, our ship or uh, tra uh, transport, it had left. Oh, I thought, geez, that's a general court. So we go down to the, to the dock, eh, and it hadn't left. It was out in the middle of the, of the bay, see, away from the pier, I guess. All the, everything was loaded and ready to go. So they take us out like we're important. You know, what do you call these little boats that take a, a VIP to the ship? They take us out there, and Major Rood was our uh, Major, the third battalion, and he looks at me, he says, uh, uh, Corporal, uh, no, PFC, I was PFC then, boy, what a rank. But you act uh, like a corporal, you know. But the Marine Corps were kind of stingy back then, they didn't want to pay a corporal's pay. So he said, uh, PFC done, he said, I'm surprised at you. He said, you were in the Raider Battalion and all, and he said, and you went AWOL. So he sent us 10 days in the brig back to Camp Pie Kakariki, which was 35 miles from the from the bay, and boy, when we got back there, uh, the uh, uh, provost marshal said, done, if you don't give me any trouble, he said, you two don't give me any trouble, he said, you can have liberty every night in Pie Kakariki. Well, when we were at Pie Kakariki, I never went to Pie Kakariki, it was just a small little town, had a few, later on, I'll tell you, he got killed on Tarawa. Okay, talking about Tarawa. When we were aboard ship the night before we we're going to hit the island, the captain says that, uh, tells all us fellows that's got any kind of experience to let the new replacements have her turn at shooting. Get them used to battle. So he said, this is more or less like a maneuver. And of course, I felt disappointed. I felt, why, you know, I didn't want to just go in a movie. Let's get into some action. It was action, all right, that we never thought or dreamed of. They said that the, the uh, uh, bombing and the, and the battleships with the, uh, uh, you know, the 16 inch shells were going to pulverize the island. Be lucky if there'd be any opposition at all. Well, as you know, if you read the, the tale on Tarawa, that wasn't so. Getting into the Higgins boat, going down to, I'm a demolition man, and uh, up until this time, I never acted as a demolition man when I was in the Raider Battalion. I was a rifleman. But they wanted a demolition man, and, and the night before, I don't know who the other fellow was, whether he ever made it in or not from the battalion. There was two of us. And when we're putting the, uh, uh, I would uh, take, uh, this was dynamite. And I'd take uh, uh, maybe three or four sticks of dynamite and prime and tape three or four together and sometimes just two together in case, depending on, on what I had to blow up, see. But this pack will hold 36 sticks, uh, sticks of dynamite. I got 44 of mine. <laughs> We're just like kids. This other fellow, he said, I said, I'm going to take one more than you. And I imagine that. There's, we're up on deck the day before. And we're priming them, you know, putting a primer in there, taking a, a wooden dial like and putting a hole in there and priming and, and taping them. And putting them in this pack. This pack goes on top of your regular pack. See? So I had 44 sticks of dynamite going in. So when I get going down, we're late getting started because the first thing, the Japs, this is the first time we knew they could do anything, they threw a few shells and landed close to our transport ship, and the orders was given to go on out further to the captain of the ship. See? So we went out further, 
And so the night before, the captain told us that, that the Higgins boats would clear the reef by a few inches. Frogman from the Navy was supposed to went in and check the water depth. Well, that might have been true if we had went in on time, see? But even then, I thought that I was uh, talking to my buddies, I said, you know, two inches, gee, that ain't much clearance, you know? So when we're going in, uh, first of all, when I'm going down the, Higg uh, down the net, getting into the Higgins boat, it's bobbing and weaving, you know? There's a fellow named Campbell, and he was supposed to have been the most, uh, he, uh, with this outfit when we were on Guadalcanal, he was supposed to went out on more, more uh, behind the lines uh, uh, patrols than anybody, see? Well, this guy always acted like a kid to me, and uh, I never went on liberty with him because he would throw his, like when down at the St. George Hotel, he'd throw his pitch cutter up in there and, and there'd be a lot of women standing at the corner. He says, here I am, you lucky woman. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, you know. But I thought, boy, in battle, he might be a little goofy outside, but in battle, I want to be with him. So when I sat down, there was only that one seat on the starboard side of this Higgins boat. And it was about two thirds back from the, from the uh, ramp, the front of uh, the bow of the boat, see. I sat down by him and when I talked to him, I kept telling him he was always happy and go lucky and he just didn't hardly talk. I said, cheer up, Campbell. I said, after this little exercise, I said, they tell us we're going back to Hawaii, there'll be wine, women, and songs. I said, be merry, let's go. More I looked at him, it was death all over his face, it seemed like. Something told me, and if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here today to tell you this story. I decided I'd get up. I didn't want to sit next to him, you know. He was too, uh, he's not positive. He's already uh, surrendering in his mind, see. So I go forward. There's no seat to stand. So the Higgins boat has a ramp. Oh, I don't know just what the angle is, but it's pretty steep you know, angle. And so I stand up there on the starboard side and get up on it a little bit and put my hand on the uh, arm on the gunnel so I can see out, see? So when we're going in, we're finally, uh, they rendezvous out in the ocean, you know, uh, in circles, this group and that group. Finally, we're given the order to go in. And uh, it's a long ways. And we're going in on the Higgins boat and uh, before we even get anywhere near the ramp, the Higgins boat to our left is blown up. It's a direct hit, and body parts are coming over. And I'm looking at these new recruits, you know, they're just uh, replacements from the States. Uh, the fellows uh, were uh, the second, uh, just like, uh, just like the, the Raider Battalion, lost a lot of men through sickness, through uh, malaria and stuff like that. And those that were wounded, of course, went back. And there, I can see them, uh, you know, they're, they're turning a little frantic about the parts coming over. Well, we don't go too much further. And the Higgins boat on our right gets the same thing. Same thing's coming over, see? So we're kind of isolated there. So anyway, when we, I can see the Amtraks. These are caterpillar kind of, uh, like a tank that goes through the water only carries troops. It's called an Amtrak. That's what the second Marines are using. They're supposed to go in, and they're to the right of the pier. But I can see from where I'm at, I'm telling them what all's going on. I can see it, none of them got to the beach. I said, there's one to the left of the beach. I said, but it's not to the beach, see? I said, I can even see the reef. I said, it looks like it's on top of the water. Sure enough, that's about what it was, so when we're getting closer, I hollered back. I said, tell the, uh, the coxswain to give this thing full speed. Maybe we'll glide over the reef, hopefully. But we didn't. Just went up there and stalled, see? Well, when it did that, we're hollering back. The coxswain froze, or he couldn't get the winch. It was crank, had to crank it by hand to let the ramp down to get out of this thing, see? So I decided I better get the hell out because I can see we're, we're right front, we're 500 yards from shore. That's, might say, uh, point blank with uh, shore guns firing at you. So I get up on the ramp just as it's starting to go down, and I jump off. And with all this weight, 
I thought I was going to stand on on hit uh, Carl, but this happened to be a big shell hole or something. So when I jump off, I go down, down, down. Well, I have to tell you later on why, but I open my eyes as soon as I'm underwater. I've always do that. And I could see a red, everything turned perfectly red, but I didn't hear nothing. Perfectly red, see? And I'm thinking these other guys are going to jump off on top of me and drown me if I don't get out. So I'm using what you call a breaststroke, you know, with all this weight on to try to get out from underneath. I never looked back, but only a couple got out of that Higgins boat. When that ramp went down, the, the, the red f uh, flash that I saw underneath must have been a direct hit. See, everybody got killed in that boat, see. So when I'm going to, when I do surface, when I do come to the surface, it's like raindrops hitting the water. That's the machine guns, bullets hitting the water. And I cock my helmet to the one side, the reef at six out 500 yards out to the, and even beyond the reef, see, is 500 yards, 1,500 yards. It sticks out 500 yards from the beach, and it's 1,500 yards to that uh, pier. Now, if we go straight in, some of them did from the other Higgins boats, suicide. The water's going to get shallower, and those Japs uh, are dug in. They have trenches dug there. And uh, I could see a lot of them just falling. You know, all of a sudden you look and you see a bunch of men fall, shot down, see. Going in, there was, uh, there was some outhouses that they put out, you know, to use as toilet latrines out there. And uh, I remember uh, seeing uh, uh, bullets, uh, you know, hitting, going, and they're not coming from the shore. And I looked around, so I turned my uh, M1 on that, on that outhouse. Hopefully I got them. I never saw any more bullets. But make a long story short, when I'm going through this water, most, most, of, the, most of the Marines are afraid to get off what even Higgins boats are hung up on the reef because they probably can't swim. They never taught you to swim in the Marine Corps. See, swimming wouldn't do you too much good when you hit deep water and you got a pack and a rifle on. But when I was a little boy, seven years old, in the Wissahickon Creek back in Pennsylvania, my oldest sister taught me to swim, or trying to teach me to swim. There was two ponds on this. Uh, we, my dad worked on this rich estate. And they had the upper pond was deeper water and the lower pond. And lower pond, there was a driveway went through it. It was concrete on the bottom and stepping stones. And then the pond down below it, it was maybe two or three feet deep. See, my sister wanted to make sure I could swim before I went up to the upper pond. She was a beautiful sister, five years older. And, you know, she took care of me, taught me everything. So when I'm, when I'm she's trying to teach me to swim, I'm walking through the water because that's the way cats and dogs do. And she said, no, you gotta put your head. So anyway, I convinced her one time that I could swim by doing the breaststroke underwater. But when I got out of that Higgins boat, and I'm going, when I, my feet did touch bottom, I'm trying to keep as low as possible for these bullets, uh, you know, shooting at you. And I'm going along, just crunching down as low, keeping down, the water is my protection. See? And I'm walking like, and all of a sudden when I come to deep water, I'm walking. And I thought about when I was a kid, and I can walk through deep water, I don't care if it's a mile deep, with plenty of weight and still not drown. And the way that's done, you'd shallow breathe and you put a lot of air in your lungs and you can walk. Uh, show you later on, I got demonstrations that I put on for the armed forces on that. But anyway, I'm one of the fortunate. I make it all the way to the pier, you know, and I don't know how long that took, maybe several hours. And some of the guys saw me and they said, done, right before we got to the pier, John Earhart, he's still living, I hope, in, in uh, New York. I talked to him about six months ago, planning to try to see him this year. He's not too good a health. And uh, he said him and, uh, and a fellow named uh, Levezo and uh, Jim uh, uh, Corbett from Milwaukee, they said, done, for Christ's sake, drop that, 
Drop that bomb you're carrying on your back. If they hit you, we'll all blow up. See, because all these were primed, you know. So we're just short, and I wanted to carry it all the way in. But, you know, I felt so relieved when I dropped the pack finally. I listened to him because the water's getting pretty shallow. And what we're doing, we're timing ourselves with the Navy planes that's coming in and strafing to keep the Japs' head down. And then we're going to make a run when we figure we're close enough. We're going to make a run for the pier. And when we did, I can still see the bullets. They didn't get any of it. They were shooting too high. But the pier is wooden pier, you know, uh, and... The bullets were knocking off the chips of wood on the on the pillars that's holding up the pier. Well, when we got to the, when we got into the under the pier, crabs were tramping on all kinds of dead bodies. Some of them were, must have been Marines, and some of them were uh, probably Japs that were underneath their snipers. And these were the casualties from the fellows that came in on the Amtrak's. See, it never made it ashore. But anyway. We feel safe going under that uh, uh, pier all the way to the shore. And nobody's on the left of the pier. Everybody's on the right. And when I get in, I can remember being really highly irritated. Why uh, Colonel uh, Crow didn't, didn't go forward. They kept there. They had all these Marines along the beach. They should have moved out. If they had moved out, we wouldn't have lost all the men that we did coming in. So anyway, there was a Sergeant uh, Covington and uh, another one, Jim Summers, and they were older Marines. Jim Summers uh, stayed in the Marine Corps and he became an officer, and uh, he ended up a, a, a colonel in the Marine Corps, but he passed away four or five years ago. And uh, anyway, we went over the, over the uh, pier, other side, and decided we'd move fast and then go in and see what happens. Because we knew they were, they were dropping knee mortars, and we knew if we stayed there, you know, sooner or later we're going to get killed. So when we went and went over the wall, it had a little sea wall up, maybe three feet high. Behind that was trenches reinforced with coconut logs and uh, like uh, rebarbed to uh, put them together. And when I went over, I remember looking quick, didn't see any Japs, and in, in, in neither did the other fellows. So. Uh, the Higgins boat, they a fast boat, and it's the only way, this was the first uh, assault using Higgins boats uh, at the, uh, to assault an island. Uh, uh, they claim it was successful. I think it was the goofiest operation in the world because we lost a lot of good men. Tarawa was the last island on a chain of islands that looks like a question mark. And there was no fortification on these other islands, see? Why didn't we land on the other islands, set up artillery, and keep bombing this place? Because the island actually didn't serve any purpose. It wasn't big enough for uh, B-29s or anything to come in to land. Why we took it, I don't know. But we lost a lot of good men. The Higgins boat has a, has a bench down the middle that you sit on and benches on each side, see? You don't see nothing. I don't like being in a Higgins boat in that capacity. I always stand up. I want to see what's going on, see? So when we went into Saipan, we hit Saipan on June the 15th, 1944, my mother's birthday. Okay, when we go in there, same thing's happening. We lost a Higgins boat to our left and one to our right, but I don't know how bad, but they never made it in. But when we hit the island, we're, we are isolated from the main force that's going in by maybe a couple hundred yards, see? Now, when we went in, I remember Japs being up in the trees, a few Japs, of course, they'd done this on Guadalcanal. They'd tie themselves up there and shoot. So when I saw them, it's the first time I got my hands on a, on a Thompson submachine gun. The coxswain on this Higgin boat had a Thompson submachine gun. So I relieved him of it, see. I'm a corporal acting as sergeant. I said, you don't need this. I said, I'll give you this M1. This Higgins, uh, this Thompson submachine gun carried 20 rounds of ammunition and a clip, and they gave me a couple extra clips, and I used that. Boy, this is a good weapon for close range. I got so I could peel off one shot, doom, doom. When I saw these Japs up in the tree, we eliminated them before we even got in there. 
you know. But when we got in, see, the Japs, like any other island, if you're going to defend, you would already have pre uh, 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 artillery firing. They knew, uh, you know, uh, on these beaches to cover the beaches, see. So when we went in there, when we got out of the Higgins boat, it's just a little slope up to the island, up to, uh, off the beach. And there it's like a parade ground. It's gravel. I think it's a parade ground or else it's a, a, a place where they park their motor pool, their trucks and stuff. Or it's too far away from the airport, so it wasn't for uh, any planes or anything. But here comes three Jap tanks at us. They're going to push us back into the ocean, they think, see? So I gave the orders to drop our packs, see, so that we wouldn't be encumbered as far as moving fast. Just the ammunition. We'll come back and get the packs. This is what, I, this is what we thought we were going to do. So we dropped the packs and put them in a the pile, see, and we went forward. The Japs tanks are upon us. They got a few foot soldiers behind. We only had one bazooka man. Bazooka was the first time that you would say a self-propelled rocket that you could launch. Uh, I don't know where you ever heard of bazookas, but this was the first. And I had one man with me, and he wasn't from my outfit, see? And he was there, and I said, well, I said, come along, let's see whether we can knock out these tanks. And I think he did, he, he crippled a couple of them, see? As we're going along, we're shooting and uh, uh, they're using canister shots, the, the Japs. And this is like, uh, would be like a shotgun. Mm -hmm. A lot of shots coming out. But I'm lucky, I get through, I don't know how many got through, the, but we never went back to get our packs. Well, I kept letters in my packs that I got from my mother and my brother and my father and my sister. They always wrote to me. You weren't supposed to do this. You weren't supposed to take anything that identify you. But I was never a GI Marine. I thought, oh, this is good to read when you're in, in there, just like it did on Tarawa. See, so I took, I took letters in there. Well, evidently, the second wave or somebody else later on got killed near those packs, and evidently those packs were blown up, see? And whoever got killed next to the pack, must have got killed next to my pack, didn't have any dog tags, and they thought it was Jim Dunn. It wasn't Jim Dunn. I wouldn't be here talking to you, right? So we had a few people what we called uh, screw-ups in every outfit. You have some that's not really what you'd call a first-class Marine. We had one such person. I don't know whether I should mention his name. He's probably dead anyway. But anyway, his name was Peters. And he comes up, they round up, this is after we're up on the mountains fight, you know, and it, it, we pretty well got the island secured. He comes up because they're taking all the goof-offs off the beaches and sending them to their units, mm -hmm. see? Peterson comes up. Now, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't believe this guy normally, but he came up and he seen me, and I could tell by his expression, he thought he saw a ghost. He said, Sergeant Dunn, he said, I saw your grave down on the beach. And I said... Peters, I said, join Earhart over there. Get on the right flank. This is Earhart I'm telling you about it. lives in New York. I said, get on the right flank with him, you know. So then I thought about it. Well, our captain was wounded, and he was no longer with us. And Adrian was my platoon leader, lieutenant. He was acting as captain. So I go back to the CP, and I said, say, uh, Adrian, I said, you know, I said, Peters came up and he said he saw my grave down on the beach. I said, that wouldn't be possible, would it? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, they wouldn't send anything home to that extent. That's what I was interested in, sending anything home. He said, oh, no. He said, you know the, the rules, uh, how that happens. He said, they'd have to check with battalion and then check with company and check with the platoon to see, to verify somebody being killed. Hmm, I thought that, right? But when it came to mail call, I wasn't getting any mail, see? So all the time I'm on side pain, I don't get any mail. And I was going to write my dad and mom about this incident because I went down and saw my own grave. Sure enough, it was down there, you know. And, uh, but I couldn't find a, didn't have a camera and couldn't find anybody to take a picture of it, see? So <laughs> when we're over on, t when we hit 
Tinian, that's the next island over. See, when we go in, in there, after Tinian, I get wounded on Tinian. See, shrapnel in the legs, but not nothing real bad. So they uh, take me back to Saipan because uh, where the where the uh, uh, sugar cane factory was on Saipan, the Japs had. They, the we set up he's a the hospital guy that opens there. The doors, right? Well, he's supposed. He's a guy that's operating the boat. He's okay. back there. He's the, uh, the pilot, you might say. Okay, tell me just a little bit about his job in the boat. And I, I just really want to focus for a minute on the <coughs> boat. And tell me about the ramps going down. Okay, the ramp. Uh, tell me what you remember the, about it. Actually, the coxswain, does he give an order? Does he sound an alarm? And then tell me about the ramps going down. Well, like for instance, when we hit Tarawa, right? When you hit the, uh, uh, you can't go no further. See, when you hit the beach, normally, we're going to hit a sandy beach. The ramp goes down and let the troops out, see? And I think that's just, uh, I don't know whether, whether it was a, a, a electrical like it would be now or whether it was hand-operated. I think it was hand-operated. You'd turn the winch, see? Well, he sort of froze, see? So we hired for a Marine to get up there. Get up there and, and lower the ramp. Well, when they're doing this, I'm thinking all the time, boy, you know, th these seconds are seeming like minutes. You know, we're gonna catch one right and blow up this whole boat. So I, I climb up on the ramp pretty hard, it's pretty steep, just as it was starting to go down and I jumped off. But uh, it's, not a, it's just a, a platform back there. He's a little bit higher than what uh, uh, the people, uh, the uh, troops that's in there, they'd be lower down there and the hold the ship, like, uh, a boat like. It's a, kind of like a flat bottom uh, uh, landing craft. And it's, uh, it's pretty fast, uh, but not fast when you think that somebody's shooting at you. It's a slow moving target, see? But it was fast for, uh, uh, be a lot faster than, uh, it wouldn't be as fast as some of our uh, uh, pleasure crafts now, but it was considered pretty fast, Higgins boats. They were used on Guadalcanal, and when they hit Tulagi, uh, the uh, president turned up, you know, John Kennedy, uh, Kennedy he, he was a, uh, a lieutenant, and uh, he was one of the, uh, on the Higgins boats, he was uh, in the Navy, and I think he was maybe a, uh, uh, in charge of, of those uh, type of boats. Okay. Tell, I, tell me about what, what's going through your mind. You're on the Higgins boat, you're going to shore. Tell me what's going through your mind, and what are the men around you? Are they, are they, are there's a lot of anxiety? What, what are you thinking about? Well, me, I always talk to the good man upstairs. I told him, look, even when, before the first battle I ever went in, I said, I want, you, I want you, the Holy Spirit to give me courage not to be afraid, because if you're afraid, you can't act. See, I was never really afraid, see, but I knew I was either coming back in good shape or not coming back at all, see, and that was my philosophy all through the war, see, and I never shrank from, from duty, see, and like, uh, my hearing was awful good back then. Like when we'd be in the, in the, like on, on Saipan, let's say on Saipan, because uh, Tarawa was, was real fast in only 72 hours. On Saipan, when other, uh, at night, and when we were up on the mountains, uh, I could hear the Japs. I could nearly tell just where they were, and I'd say, don't, don't, be, don't be in a hurry. I know where he's at, see. And at night, in the Raider Battalion, we learned to shoot at night. Uh, when you fire a rifle at night, you have a tendency to fire too high, see? And it takes a lot of practice, and mostly you fire from the hip, and your body point the, uh, the rifle towards the noise. And I could be pretty darn accurate at that. But the Higgins boat, when you're in there, what are you thinking about? Huh? You're thinking, you're, you're hoping you're gonna make it to shore. <laughs> Let's face that, especially when other boats are being blown up around you. I imagine this, uh, you know, when I looked down on those guys, I was standing up, I could see the fright in their eyes, see? But that soon leaves you when it comes to the actual battle. You're not, you're not scared in the sense, at least I wasn't, and I don't think any of may, you're not scared in the sense where you freeze, see? When I came up out of that water after jumping off, coming up, and I saw the bullets hitting like raindrops, I was just hoping I would be in between them, see? And the further, and I didn't want to be around a crowd, see? 
when I went, when I was heading for that 1500 yard walk, I was trying to keep away from the crowd because that's what they're going to be shooting at. If you were on the shore, you'd want to get as much of the enemy as you could, wouldn't you? You'd be shooting at groups. See, I was wanting to keep isolated, but I was telling fellows as I went along, just try walking through the water, but <laughs> they must've thought I was delirious. You know, <laughs> if I told you to walk through the water without showing you how, you'd, you'd say, what, what's he talking about? You know, so I put on these demonstrations in 1983 for the armed forces to show them how they could survive, see, so. You, you made me think about something. When you're in the boats, to, just tell me, what, what, are you, what are you hearing? Are you hearing the waves? Are you hearing bullets? Are you hearing men or, or, or you know, what, what, are you, what are you actually hearing? Is the, is the boat loud? I mean, tell me about what you're hearing. <laughs> well, the lieutenant was in our uh, 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 boat. Or, uh, he's the only one that's in contact. He's, he's got a, uh, there's a radio man attached to every, no, it wasn't lieutenant. The radio man was in our boat. He is being in contact with the battalion commander or something, uh, 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 or the company commander, telling what to do with our boat, when to go in, you know, see? So you don't hear very much. You're, you're, uh, you're interpreting what he's hearing. Okay, but as a Marine, yeah. what, what do you, I mean, you're going into battle. Are you hearing the other men talking? Are you hearing the wind? Are you hearing the, the waves? Are you hearing bullets? Are you hearing explosions? Yeah. What, picture that for me. Tell me. Well, that. when you talk to the other fellows, I don't know. I wasn't sitting right down in there, but I was talking to everybody because they'd ask me, Dunn, what do you see? And I'd tell them what I saw. And I was more or less the communicator between them, you know, uh, telling them uh, what was going on. Like I, like I was seeing the action because I was standing up, see? And, and uh, they were sitting down, see? The Higgins boat is... Uh, Unless you're holding on to something, it's, uh, you know, it's rocking, uh, even though it's moving. And, uh, of course, if you have any kind of balance, you can, you can hold your balance. But nobody's standing up in it. They're sitting down. They want to be down. They, they don't want to get hit. They figure the, the, uh, the boat itself is some protection. But, of course, not from a shore gun. You know, it's going to run. These, these boats are plywood, see? and uh, probably some sheet metal on the outside of them. Uh, I never went and really investigated just what they are, but I assume that they're light boats. They have to be light because they're carrying a bunch of men, probably 20 men or more, maybe 30. I don't know how many sitting there, see? But uh, what they're talking about, I guess one or another, talking to one another, so, you know, who knows what. I imagine a lot of them are praying if they never prayed before, you know. Uh, it's just natural you're calling on some higher authority to protect you because uh, you know you're vulnerable. You know, you're out there, uh, just like I tell uh, people when I put on demonstration to walk in through deep water. I can fire a rifle in deep water. If you're on land, at least I got a little bit of a chance. See, I'm going to, if, if I'm 100 yards from shore and I see you on land, my, I'm a sm small target too out there in the ocean, see, especially if there's any kind of waves, see, I'm pretty hard to hit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you go for cover. If I miss you, it's going to be close enough that you're going to hear the whiz of the bullet, see. So uh, uh, when you're in a Higgins boat, what are you thinking about? Uh, that's what you're thinking about. We hope you make it to the shore and can get in there where you have a chance because you're vulnerable in the water, see. So uh, I would imagine that's what they're talking to and talking to the man upstairs. I did, and that gives you a lot of peace and calm. See, see, I always felt no matter how rugged it is, Jim Dunn's going to make it. And I think that's the reason I made it. See. Good, good. Um, just tell me. We've only got a few more minutes left on the tape, but. I want to be able to show this to kids today, okay? Okay. What would you say, after looking back on your experience with the war and what you've been through, Tom Brokaw calls it the greatest generation, World War II. What would you say to kids of today, just, just in a, a couple of minutes, what would you say to them based on your experience in life, being in the war, the freedoms we have today, what would you say to today's generation? Well, I would say today's generation 
<clears throat> you know, they sit and watch so much television and things like this. Keep, keep your body in good shape, see? I today feel like I could go in the Marine Corps and still be a, a good Marine, see? I think I could handle, I can handle most, most, uh, uh, even an athlete in high school. Uh, I can still do 60, 70 push-ups at a crack, see? And uh, 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 far, uh, probably far, far more stronger. And I think they should keep in good health, keep themselves in good health. Eat good food. Uh, today, people are, uh, when I was a boy, when I first went in the Marine Corps and I went with you and we went into a restaurant, I didn't know how to order. I didn't know what a steak was, see? So I'd say, well, whatever John wants, I'll have the same. And then I learned what it was, you know, see? But today, they're eating so much junk food. People are having Pepsi Colas for breakfast, kids, and Coca-Colas. I, t I eat everything according to how God put it on the earth. I try to eat it less, uh, the least man messes with it, uh, the better the food is. I eat a lot of raw food. I eat a lot of nuts and things like that. I eat apples and grapefruits and oranges, and I try to eat a variety. I try to eat... I try to eat 30 different things a day, a little bit of everything. Then I don't need vitamin pills. The vitamin pills, can you imagine somebody making a vitamin pill the size of a, of a pea and claiming you what good it's gonna do? If you want, if you want potassium, eat you some bananas and, and things like that. Keep yourself in good health. That's, that's physically. Spiritually, keep yourself in good spiritual health. See? Don't, don't get carried away with the things that are detrimental to your mind. You guys say you do a salute or? We usually salute and say pledge allegiance to the flag. And we always ask God to bless every citizen that lives here and then throughout the whole world. I'm a life member of the Marine Corps League and uh, the Veterans of Foreign Wars and the Disabled Veterans. Although I'm not disabled. Uh, okay, go ahead. How's that for a young fellow? I like to, how about a salute? A salute? You betcha. Okay, perfect.